welcome. Um, welcome to this presentation talking about our partnership between CU and Fort Lewis College. My name is Zenny Whittall. Um, I work in the CU Boulder College of Arts and Sciences recruitment office. Um, and we're very happy and excited to share this, uh, the possibilities and opportunities of graduate programs at CU Boulder. Um, there's already this bi-directional partnership between our institutions, uh, and we look forward to strengthening it as we go on here. Um, for me, uh, you may have already noticed, I was saying hi to Mike Larson there. Um, I remember my time back at Fort Lewis. That is my undergraduate alma mater. Um, I used to manage Magpies down on Main Street. So if you've ever had the best coffee in Durango and gotten some magazines, I set up a lot of that actually. Um, now we've divided the program into three sections today. Um, panelists and colleagues will be sharing their experiences and journeys as we go through here. It'll be time to, at the end to ask questions. And if you have any, uh, put them in the chat and then I'll be able to make sure I address them as we go through. But the three sections we'll go over is those academic journeys, what to know, how to plan, and um, then we'll have that time for questions, as I said. So to get us going here, let's see if I can't make my computer work correctly. We'll go with academic journeys. And Dr. Schneider, if you wouldn't give your experience. Thanks, Benny. Um, can you all hear me on Zoom? Is the audio okay for on my end? Okay, cool. Um, and what is your name who just walked in? Oh, my name's Kaylin. Kaylin, what is the major you're considering applying, like pursuing in your grad? I'm not really sure yet. I'm thinking like major in environmental science, like engineering. Okay, well, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here. Um, so as you can see on the screen, uh, my PhD is in English. I graduated from University of Colorado Boulder in 2019. Before that, I got a master's at Oregon State. I'm going to make eye contact with you all, so um, <laughs> you're a curious person, right? Um, I got my master's degree at Oregon State University in literature and culture. And before that, um, I was undergrad in my hometown. I didn't even apply to any other undergrad. Um, I'm a first-gen student, and there was a lot of disconnect for me in terms of what it really meant in terms of shopping around to different institutions. I, it did not occur to me that different institutions had different strengths. Um, it didn't occur to me to look into the credentials of the faculty I wanted to work with. I just thought a school was a school was a school. So it was at the undergraduate level that I had mentors who stepped in and said, like, here are some things you should look for in the school you're thinking of applying to. Um, and if I could make my very short list of the things that were my priorities in my academic journey, um, being relatively close to home was a big uh, value for me. Um, again, I'm first gen, my parents and my family, my friend group didn't really understand uh, that school was maybe going to take me far away from that. So I did end up pretty far from home for my master's program. When I was done applying to PhDs, I knew I needed to be someplace where I could get home more easily. So I'm from North Dakota. Um, I went to Oregon State. It was like a $600 minimum flight home. Um, it sucked. So then like, when I when I applied to CU Boulder, not only were there faculty there who were world class in my field, it was a $60 frontier flight to get home to North Dakota. Um, so that was a crucial part of my decision making fact, uh, process is like knowing that I had that access to the people that I value that like supported me, even if I didn't understand all the time what I was doing. Um, another thing I mentioned briefly is uh, knowing the field I wanted to pursue, knowing the faculty members were going to be world class, or at least um, at the top of the ranks in the nation in their in their major, because it afforded me a leg up in my pursuit. In once it became time for me to pursue my career, my faculty members knew people at other institutions; they were well known themselves, um, and uh, the things that they were working on were again like at the top tier of research happening in that field. Um, it really gave me a leg up when it came time to examining. Um, the course I would take in my own in my own research. So finding those mentoring connections um, with faculty. So I could say more in any direction. Um, funding obviously is hugely important. Um, the uh, kind of cultural opportunities in the city you end up in um, may be more or less important to, to certain people. I have friends who said I can never live anywhere where I can't get a certain type of cookie, for example. I have friends who said I could never live anywhere that wasn't within a day's drive of the ocean or a day's drive of good skiing, for example. So I can say a bit more about other considerations, but um, being close to home was a hugely important factor and finding faculty who uh, could, could not only be at the top of their game in their field, but who um, I had the sense who would actually have time for me, who would make that time to make those connections with me. Um, 
So that's just so much my experience. I'd love to maybe tailor some comments um, to getting to more to the nitty gritty of what you all are interested in. But I'm actually gonna pass the mic now to the other people Zenny has on the roster who might be talking about their academic journeys and what stood out to them in their decision-making process. So who do we Absolutely. have next? Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, oh, and I forgot how we had all of our good um, uh, animations in here. Nice. I'm gonna remember that one of these days. Um, so with the what to know in academic journeys, um, you know, Dr. Schneider shared her experience of how she went from not even knowing where to go to finding that right spot. Um, today we have with us uh, Sarah Kernick and Andy Cow. And they're going to, along with Amir Sadafi, who is one of our graduate recruiters, and I would leave it to those three to kind of give our experience of, you know, how do we find the community in our graduate programs, um, being lifelong learners throughout uh, the experience, and then, of course, you know, speaking to funding availability, um, that type of experience. So if Sarah, Andy, Amir, whoever wants to take it off first. I'll let you go. Amir, can you speak to sure. funding? Yes, yeah, absolutely. We'll go that way. absolutely. So um, I think one of the benefits of uh, being able to study at a tier one research institution like uh, CU Boulder is access to a wide amount of funding. Now, the most generous funding packages for our graduate students typically are reserved for our PhD students or even students who are undertaking master's courses as part of their PhD program. So a number of our arts and science programs do allow for direct entry from the bachelor's level into the PhD program, um, inclusive of which would be a, a top master's in that program. Now funding at the graduate level, as I mentioned, is most generous uh, when it comes in the form of an assistantship. An assistantship is essentially in a, in a arrangement and agreement between you and the faculty of your department in which you will be working for your faculty up to 20 hours per week as a research or teaching assistant based on the needs of the department and in exchange for that you will uh, receive a tuition waiver and a stipend that will help cover your living expenses. Uh, this arrangement is really mutually beneficial both for the department that needs the assistance of their graduate students to conduct their research and teaching responsibilities. And of course, it's beneficial for the student in that they're able to secure funding so they can focus on their academic studies. Now, not all programs will have this um, assistantship available to them. A number of our professional masters, for example, these are master's programs that we offer that are more geared towards students that aren't necessarily thinking about going on to do a PhD program or looking for a career in research, but rather are looking to secure a job in industry. Those master type programs Typically, students are unable to secure assistantships in them, but instead, many of the departments are able to provide some level of scholarship, oftentimes merit-based scholarships, but there are a number of other types of scholarships that students can avail themselves of for those programs. And then we also have uh, fellowships available to students. These can be um, arranged thematically around a specific theme or research project. Um, and sometimes uh, they can come without the same level of commitment of working for uh, the department. But in general, for most students in arts and sciences, the prized type of funding to secure is that uh, research or teaching assistantship that will give you kind of valuable experience in your own department, um, in addition to the funding as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shamir. My pleasure. Um, Andy, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that graduate student mentor, how it is a little bit different from that undergraduate experience, how, um, I don't know, just the structure and nature of when you're a graduate student, how it's a little bit different than what students coming from Fort Lewis might be experiencing already. Um, actually, I will, uh, Sarah, would you like to talk about that? And I can kind of follow up um, you with a little bit more about the, the, the broader issues of community on campus and how to find those communities. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, so when applying for a grad program, uh, I feel that you, yes, you're applying to a school, but you're also applying to work with an individual. 
and your specific mentor, your advisor, the person who you are there to work with uh, ends up being your sort of primary point of contact in a lot of ways. Uh, and that what's really important is to find a place where you feel like you have a good fit with your advisor uh, and that you two sort of have similar goals, uh, similar methods, and that you get along reasonably well. Uh, I know that having a strong and positive relationship with my advisor was one of the really important aspects uh, for me of being able to get through graduate school. Uh, and I didn't realize sort of how important this relationship was until after I was already there. Uh, but I think trying to find an individual that you are interested in working with uh, is really uh, important in this process. And I, I will just add that in addition to finding an advisor, which is really step number one, that's absolutely crucial. You're not going to succeed without that good relationship. But in addition, there are many ways to find a sense of belonging here on this campus and find additional people who will support you. And I think that's also really crucial. So, um, and, and I'm speaking specifically from my position as a director of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies, and, and not that everyone listening to this is, is necessarily identifying with that um, identity, but um, we have a number of centers on campus um, for things like Native American and Indigenous Studies, for African and African American Studies, Latin American Studies, and those are, centers which are not just for people who are studying specifically that topic, but they're also great places to come for support and to find other students who may be, like if you were Native American or if you were Latin American, um, to find events where you can feel at home, make some connections, um, find other faculty who are gonna be especially interested and supportive of you. So really, you know, you, you shouldn't just find only that one advisor and isolate yourself in that with that one person or in that one department. There are a lot of other opportunities when you come to a campus like this. And it, it can be kind of daunting when you get here and it's a large town and there's 30,000 students. And so these kinds of centers and, and other similar opportunities are really important to, to reach out for and, and find a, a smaller community of people that are going to make you feel supported and comfortable on campus and not just leave you feeling like I'm the one person I know like me in this department or, you know, and, and I, I, I don't feel like I have any other connections outside of that, that narrow framework. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah and Andy. So, you know, what I would add is, you know, coming from Fort Lewis to CU, and I'm not in that student uh, modality, although I did my MBA here at CU, um, the big difference is just size of campus. But it's one of those when uh, both Sarah and Andy are talking about you're finding your community both with that mentor, but then however you identify and the resources of a large campus like us. Um, are expansive and make it very, um, I'd say, readily available to find community. It's just a little bit more um, intentional than it is back at the fort, because I know the fort, it was, I could walk from the Baders over to West Hall, and I saw all of everybody in the community, right? So it's a little bit different, um, just size-wise. So, Sarah, Andy, if you could speak to the whole research aspect of being at CU in graduate school and how you discover your research topic. You know, oftentimes I find students, undergrad and graduate, um, forget that we're in school to learn and that your professors aren't actually expecting you to know everything that we're learning about, right? So it's, I'm coming to graduate school, but I don't have to have that groundbreaking, unique research idea and focus yet that's part of what I'm gonna develop in my program. Am I correct there? What, what would you all say to that experience? I would completely agree with that. Uh, and oftentimes when we're looking at applications, we want students who haven't fully formed their ideas yet, that that's actually a good thing uh, because we want them to start taking our classes here, start interacting with the faculty members here, and through those interactions, through those initial classes, start to formulate different ideas. Uh, and we actually do wanna leave our imprint on the students. 
So uh, I completely agree with you that you don't need to have this these ideas fully formed. Uh, we want to form them with you collaboratively uh, and not just sort of expect you to have that before you get here. Yeah, and, and speaking from uh, my position, I'm in the linguistics department. And for, for master's students, we get a lot of applications from students who did not have a, a major in linguistics as an undergraduate. They just know they're interested in languages. They got exposed to it with a couple courses as an undergrad, and they want to continue to explore that. And we really welcome that. And we absolutely don't expect you to come in saying, I know exactly what I want to do. Um, and in fact, I, I would suggest that you come in with an open mind and not decide ahead of time exactly what you want to do. Now, if you're applying to a PhD program, we do expect a little bit more of, of a sense of, you know, where you might want to go with this. And so rather than just saying I'm interested in languages, you might say, I'm really interested in, in sound systems of languages or something like that. But, but even then, uh, you know, you're not expected to know what you're going to write your dissertation on. The, the whole point of this experience is for you and the faculty to work together and arrive at that as a, as a kind of joint exploration process. So definitely do not be intimidated that uh, you're supposed to know it all by the time you get here. Awesome. You know, and I'm going to move into the next slide. But, you know, for me, what I want to throw out there as somebody who did their undergraduate at Fort Lewis, and now works at TU Boulder, and I was a graduate student at TU Boulder, I'll tell you that coming from Fort Lewis, you actually have an amazing amount of preparation to be in graduate school, right? So at the fort, I remember, I actually still remember all of my professors, for the most part, all my professors' first names. Um, I even still know where some of them live. And it's that very, uh, let's say, connected uh, opportunity that you have at the fort, right? You're able to already know your professors on a first name basis. You know what research that they're getting into. And you're comfortable already going into their office hours. You're comfortable already speaking up in the middle of class and coming in with that new idea or that counter perspective, right? And that's the preparation for grad school that I think a lot of students may not have right, may not be ready for that connected to your professor experience that grad school really is going to be. So just know from my experience, you all are already ahead of the game in some ways, um, just by that Ford experience. And I'm not biased about that at all, no. Um, so graduate school and making a difference. Uh, Andy or Sarah, if you can speak to um, how it's not just theoretical research, right? How are we making that impact? How do we draw it back and actually affect our communities, right? So sometimes I think students forget that it's not just your learning, it's what are you going to bring to the rest of the world or just your own community? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, again, speaking from my, my personal academic work, uh, like I said, I work in the Department of Linguistics. And so we're interested in languages and we're interested in things like documenting languages uh, and also in helping to maintain languages and revitalize languages. So a lot of the work I actually do is with Native American communities um, off the CU campus where I'm doing things like um, doing teacher training to help people teach their own native language better and to understand some of the, the grammatical features of their language or help develop curriculum. And I have a lot of students who are very interested in that and get involved with that. So um, I have students who um, have gone to say the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming and have spent um, quite a good deal of time there working with um, native Arapaho speakers and helping understand um, how to put together say a, a preschool an Arapaho language preschool and how to develop um, curriculum for that preschool. Um, I've also had students who have done things like looked at websites, which are language learning websites, and they've actually gone and, and watched people use the websites and see, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, they've interviewed the students um, in, say, a, a, a tribal college in Oklahoma, and they've been able to write um, a master's thesis, which is analyzing the website and saying, you know, this is, this is the way this website could be more effective in helping these students in Oklahoma learn Cheyenne language, for example. So um, I, I would say most of my research is heavily oriented towards um, real world applications and 
real world social impacts. Uh, although of course th there's a theoretical side to this as well, but it's, it's not just about publishing papers and um, that's the end of the story. I'm in the anthropology department. I am an archeologist uh, and specifically I practice something called community archeology. span And the whole point of this is to make a difference in the real world and to work with uh, for uh, indigenous, uh, local, oftentimes marginalized people. So I'm a Maya archeologist and I work very closely with a group of indigenous Maya people uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Uh, and the, I, the idea is to work with this community and to together learn more about the Maya past. And a lot of what we're trying to do uh, is come up with educational material. So this past summer, for example, we produced a coloring book uh, for the children uh, who live in this particular community uh, to help them learn about sort of archaeology and Maya history. Uh, and we're we're also trying to work with the local community. They have a, an ecotourism business, essentially, uh, where they are interested in um, sort of uh, educating tourists about Maya culture. Uh, and so we are sort of helping them with that particular goal. But a lot of our goals are very practical and are very much related uh, to sort of what the community is hoping to accomplish. Thank you both. Um, so as we look at it, it's how to plan. Uh, that's part of the purpose of these uh, informationals. And so looking at how do you plan and how do you get to graduate school? So again, from my personal experience, I would say you all at the fort have a great resource just by where you're going to school, right? Um, talking to your faculty. So whoever your professors are in different um, subject areas or whatnot, you know how office hours work. Just go in and ask them, how did you find your PhD program? Did you do a master's before your PhD? Why did you go this route? Why did you find whatever school you went to? Um, look at their recommendations and you know your faculty. At the Fort, they're going to be very open and sharing for the most part. There's always that one professor, um, but they're going to share that experience with you. And that's a great roadmap a lot of times. Um, I'd also say, you know, Amir uh, representing the graduate school, great resource to be able to reach out to um, just our graduate school in general and say, hey, uh, do you know requirements for this particular program or that program? Uh, is a GRE required? Is it not? Um, you know, knowing about those things ahead of time uh, really help you because if you find out that the program that you're applying to requires a GRE and it's a week before applications are due, we might need to be the next cycle, right? Um, so there's a planning ahead things that you can be doing definitely things that you wanna be thinking about before you graduate from your bachelor's degree. Um, so I'd say even in your sophomore year, you kinda of wanna start exploring um, and looking for all of that. Uh, we have, does anybody, uh, Andy, Amir, Sarah, wanna share any hot topics, tips, or anything I missed as far as like how you plan to apply to grad school? Certainly, so um, we uh, here have put forward a number of resources for prospective graduate students since we've started actively recruiting uh, graduate students. So I myself am working predominantly with um, prospective international students, but my colleague um, Pat does work with our domestic students and hosts weekly or bi-weekly um, graduate information sessions that kind of walk you through the process and steps of how to go about applying and best tips for um, writing a statement of purpose and uh, reaching out to faculty and securing funding. So that's definitely a resource I would hope um, students take advantage of. Absolutely. I would also say contact the person that you're interested in working with. If you're Ooh, planning yeah. to apply to a particular program and you have a particular faculty member in mind, it is perfectly reasonable to reach out to them before you start the application process, introduce themselves and ask them, how does this work in your department? Do you have any tips or tricks for me? I get these emails all the time and I'm more than happy to reply to them and work, work with students to figure out how to navigate uh, the grad school application process. Uh, there's nothing intuitive about it. Uh, and just know that the faculty members are 
really happy to sort of walk you through the specifics of their particular program uh, and help you uh, sort of figure out how to apply uh, to be able to work with them specifically. Jenny, can I jump in with something to add on to this? Um, Absolutely. Maybe, maybe our panelists can speak to. So if anyone in the room is a senior and is thinking like, oh, I, I can't fathom taking the GRE anytime soon, could you speak to, um, what is the GRE? oh yeah, and we also need to know what the GRE is. So my experience ah. was when I was a senior, again, I did not have any of this direction. And so I ended up having to take the GRE and apply to grad school two years after I finished my undergrad. So A, we, we have a question of what the GRE is in the first place, and B, if any of our panelists could speak to, do you look down upon people that are taking those years between their seeing? And I know the answer is no, but if you could say a little bit more from your perspective, what that looks like to you if someone happens to be past their, you know, a year or two past their undergrad or their undergraduate degree. Absolutely, absolutely. Andy, jump for it. Yeah, that that's absolutely not a problem, and it can even be a benefit. Um, you know, sometimes it's nice to see that people have had a couple of years away from school and had a chance to experience some life and think about where they want to go, and, and now they're coming back two years later, and they're really committed to applying, um, as opposed to someone who just kind of stumbled out of undergrad and applied because they didn't quite know what else to do, right? So. So it actually can be a strength to, to, be a, to be waiting a couple of years. And the GRE, the graduate record exam, it's just a standard um, graduate exam that everybody all over the country um, takes for, and it, it's the same test um, for all the different schools. You take it once and then you just um, send the results to any place you're applying. So you don't have to take it two or three times for two to three different schools. So um, that, you know, that's quickly what that is. Yep. We, have a, so, we, have a quick, we have a quick follow-up question to that comment. Go for it. Yep. Yeah. How, long is, how long is the GRE good for? Like if you take it when you're done with your mm -hmm. Did you, you hear that? It? Yeah, Amir? Okay. We, we accept uh, scores that are up to two years old. And so what I would say is that that's specific to CU Boulder, right? Make sure if you're looking at other schools, I don't know why you would, right? Because it's CU. <laughs> um, I apologize for the, the humor. But uh, make sure you're reaching out to the schools that you are interested in applying to and asking that exact question. Because um, some schools may say two years, some schools may say one year, three years, just know what you're uh, working with there. Um, but yeah, any other thoughts there, Rebecca? Any, any other follow-ups? Yeah. Um, you guys in the room, we can have a conversation. I, I suspect Fort Lewis may have some maybe even financial resources to help pay for the jury. Um, so that's something we can have a further conversation about on our end. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if you're if you're working with uh, TRIO at all, uh, the Talent Search Upward Bound and um, Program for Academic Advancement folks, uh, absolutely go in there and they have resources to pay for the GRE for you. I can tell a 30 second horror story. When I finally got my shit together to apply to grad school, the closest town in my state that offered the GRE was an hour and a half bus ride away. I had to take an hour and a half bus ride to go take the GRE. So um, hopefully there's, you know, myself included, there are other people in your lives that can help you avoid some of those pitfalls um, and make it a smoother process for you all. Um, that's good advice to contact or to be aware of the school slash schools you're interested in applying to, um, what their uh, cutoff is for how, how long past uh, a score that they will accept. That's great advice. Right. Amir? Yeah, I just wanted to share uh, a couple of things alongside that. I Some of the international students I work with actually have to fly to another country to take that GRE exam because it's not offered in country. Um, but I was just going to note that um, something as many departments have, because of COVID, kind of temporarily waived the GRE, many of them are actually moving to waive that more permanently. Um, but I just want to draw everyone's attention to kind of two different philosophies of departments when approaching that. Some will say that the GRE is optional, uh, that you can submit it. If you have a strong score, it can boost your application, but not submitting it won't hurt your application. Whereas the other departments have gone another step further for with an eye to equity and are completely test blind. So even if you take the GRE with top scores and submit it, it will actually be hidden from you from uh, the faculty when they're reviewing applications. So just be mindful to, to notice the difference um, there with each individual department that you're looking at. And, and again, um, as we move forward here to some resources, everybody's email addresses, and I know, don't try to write these down, you know, right here. Um, Dr. Schneider has 
the list of these and she can share that with you all. Um, but just so you know, all of us are readily and easily approachable and um, um, addressable. And you heard us say earlier, email, reach out, talk to the grad program, talk to the faculty. Um, Andy, would you ever be offended if a prospective graduate student shot you a, a cold email just saying, hi, I'm excited about linguistics, tell me more. Uh, no, absolutely not. In fact, just this week, I, I got an email from a student in Iran uh, who was interested and emailed me and I responded. And uh, that, like Sarah was saying, that's perfectly ex expected. Also, just quickly, um, in terms of who some of those people on those emails were, uh, uh, the names for Taryn Andrews and Sibane Salazar, um, those, are, those are both people that are at the Center for Native American and Indigenous Studies. So Taryn is a grad student and Sibane is our administrative person there um, and also a CU alum. And they're both um, much younger than I am <laughs> and, and much, uh, much more able probably to talk to you about you know, what's Boulder like uh, to live in if you're um, 22 years old or 23 years old. Um, you know, so it's, and, and what's the campus like for someone um, that age as well. So if you don't want to talk to a faculty member, but you want to talk to a student or, or, or a, a recent student, those would be two great people to contact. Absolutely. Um, and I'm going to be throwing in a quick uh, uh, link for folks to fill out uh, our survey of this program and everything, but any questions? Um, and I would say exactly as Andy suggested, uh, Sibone, if you want to uh, shout out your student experience, please feel free not to put you on the spot. Don't feel like you have to, but um, if you wanted to. Yeah, so um, hi, everybody. I'm Sibone Salazar. I went to CU from 2010 to 2015. I transferred from CU Denver um, to CU because I really wanted more of a traditional kind of college feeling and I knew CU would provide that for me. Um, I majored in history and in ethnic studies here at CU Boulder and I got this position here at the Center for Native American Indigenous Studies about two years afterwards um, but my experience at CU uh, it was good. It was um, sort of hard to find Native American community here since there weren't a lot of students, um, you know, not a large population. I know Fort Lewis has a very large Native American population there, so I'm sure it's easy to see people that look like you or that look, you know, they come from similar backgrounds. Um, but um, at CU, I'd say it was a little bit more of a struggle to find that community and to work for it. Um, but it, it was awesome. I mean, once you, once you get in networked and, and dialed into people um, in the community and you start working with other students who have similar interests as yours, it just broadens the horizon. There's a lot of students here at CU Boulder. There's, I think, what is it, like 30,000, 35,000? It's a lot. About 35, it's 36. Over yeah, it's overwhelming. There's um, tons of people to meet. There's tons of groups to join in on. Intramural sports are fun, um, but it, it's it's a good time. I mean, like any other place, you you know, you want to find friendship, you want to make community for yourself. Um, you can do that here too. So I had I had a great time. I mean, I work here now. I love being part of this community and um, you know, seeing these programs thrive. Thank you so much. Of course. And so any, any uh, final questions, any thoughts, concerns? Anybody have last uh, comments? Yes, Dion. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm a, I go to school here at the fort. Um, what advice would you give for uh, for undergraduate students that you, I guess, that you would have wished you knew when you were an undergraduate student getting ready for grad school? Oh, that's a good one. Amir, Sibonay? Yeah, I mean, thoughts? I wish 
I would have started the process as early as possible. Um, and I think, you know, I went to Boulder as an undergrad student, and, and then I went to the University of London as a graduate student. But uh, while I was a student, I really wasn't aware of so many of the resources available to an undergraduate student on campus um, to help prepare you to get into graduate school. So I would definitely take advantage. I think you're already doing a great thing right now by joining this session. Um, but absolutely, just, you know, start the process early while you still have a chance to really beef up your application and maybe get engaged in some types of research or other types of work that can really enrich your application for, for your graduate programs. I have an answer to this question too, if I can jump in. I'm writing the, I'm writing the web addresses on the whiteboard so our students in the room can have access to these resources. I went, once I got the idea in my head that I wanted to go to grad school, I asked every single professor who would sit and talk to me their journey. So how did you make your choice? What were your deciding factors? Um, those kind of things. And I just assembled a list of anecdotal advice of what everybody I respected did to get where they got to today. Yeah, from, from my personal experience, I would say, uh, don't get stalled in not knowing exactly what you wanna do and reach out and start the process earlier than later. I did, <laughs> I did my graduate degree almost 20 years after my undergraduate and it's it's a little bit harder to be in school even grad school when you have a whole lot more life going on around you um, a five-year-old does not help you study just saying but it, that was one thing that was really hard for me coming right out of my undergrad at the fort you know it was okay i have to know exactly what i'm gonna you know, focus in for grad school, but I can't apply to grad school until I know what I'm going to focus in. And that's just a, a self-replicating, uh, defeating cycle, because like we said before, you don't have to have a fully formed, unique research point to come to grad school, right? That's part of the whole process is that discovery when you're here. Anybody else have those good, fun, food for thought or like how I never found it. Jim, are you leaning in to tell us how you found grad school? Doesn't look like he is, but I'll just add really oh, yeah. quickly. Go ahead, Andy. Just to repeat something that's already been said a couple of times. Um, people are not so much smarter than you are. And, and, you know, it's the older you get, the more you realize that um, everybody's kind of floating around in life a little bit sometimes. And, you know, you don't get intimidated. Don't think people just don't have time for you or don't care about you or that they're just so, you know, up in the clouds above you that, that um, it's, it's hopeless to even, you know, try to contact them. I mean, we're much more like you and, you um, you know, then you realize in, in terms of, you know, what we know or um, even how sure we are <laughs> of what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Other comments or questions? Yeah, Andy I just say, um, just to take, like um, Andy was saying, um, don't be afraid to ask like the stupid question or just like the out there, I don't know or the cold kind of email like, hey, does your department have funding for this? I'm struggling for X, Y, Z. I mean, in many instances, we've gotten these kind of cold emails and met with the person, created these relationships and been able to help them or find, um, you know, different partnerships in other departments and, and how we could help a student. So like just anything, you know, it could be just a couple emails here and there, you might get a response. And, I've always found that to be the most useful, especially where we work. Um, but it's it's been helpful for us to know that we're able to help somebody and then to know that these opportunities are there. You just have to ask for them. Don't be shy. Just try. Just try to do it. You might get a better response than you expected. Do you maybe forgot questions for Okay, we have a question. You can speak it into the camera. Um, how does it look doing grad school in another country? How does it look like going to grad school in a different country? Yeah, like the requirements, the 
similar yeah. um, and like how to get there and that kind of thing or is a lot harder yeah Sure. So I can speak from my experience. I, as I mentioned, I studied at CU Boulder for my undergraduate degree and then really wanted to have the experience of doing my master's abroad. Um, so I did my master's in uh, Middle East politics at um, SOAS, which was a school of Oriental and African studies at the University of London. And that was, I mean, a life changing experience for me, hands down. Honestly, to be completely frank, one of the things that did push me to look abroad uh, to Europe um, in the UK was I was intimidated by the GRE and I didn't want to take the GRE and um, European schools, UK schools don't require the GRE. Um, I, so I, I would say uh, it's, it's pretty similar to the US system. You'll find a little bit more uh, flexibility um, with like deadlines and admissions sometimes um, with the European system. And then there's also a little bit of a stronger distinction in the, in the European context between research-based degrees and taught master's degrees. We have that here as well, um, but it's slightly more pronounced in the UK system and the tracks that then follow are a little bit more rigid. Um, so I think, you know, the benefits of the U.S. system are uh, much more emphasis on interdisciplinary education, um, but absolutely, as someone who did study abroad for my master's degree, I, it was a fantastic life-changing experience, for sure. I can, thank you for that answer, and I can say a little bit more um, after this about the difference between the taught and the research MA, if that's something you're, you want to hear more about. Um, I, can, I can fill in some of those gaps. Um, well, I should jump in though. I, I think it is fair to, to also provide a warning here that um, degrees are not equivalent sometimes. And if you get a degree from Europe, um, like their master's degree or their equivalent may not be the same as a US master's degree. And, you know, depending on where you want to work afterwards, you can run into problems where, um, you know, your degree isn't accepted in a certain country or is, isn't considered equivalent to a degree from some different country. So you, you, you do want to be extra careful and not go overseas and, and spend a lot of time and then realize that, you know, you've, you've got yourself in kind of a trap. Yeah, and that's yeah. what mentors are for, right? That's what mentors are for. They're the ones that can direct you towards those choices and what's the best for what you want to do next, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I would say, um, similar to what Andy's saying is, if you have a path plan and knowing how it's all going to work out, there's also the flip side of knowing that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship in life meaning that it is not, you have to do X, Y, Z along a very narrow, thin path to get to one place. There are actually a whole lot of different routes. And this is something I found out way too late in life. Um, and I'm not really even that late in life. But I would say, again, talking to your professors, especially there at the fort, you're going to have some stories where you're like, wait, you haven't always been a professor? you got kicked out of college and you're now a professor. Um, if anybody's ever had chemistry with Dr. Esler who retired a couple of years ago, um, that was his story, you know, undergrad. He uh, actually had to leave for a little bit and then came back, crushed it. And he was a very respected uh, chemist at SC and then came to Fort Lewis. Um, so, I mean, just, talk to your professors, talk to your mentors, find their stories, and you're going to go, whoa, okay, there's not just, I have to have a 4.0, I have to have a perfect GRE, I have to have prior research experience. A lot of those have-tos that we get ourselves intimidated by actually don't exist, is what I would say. Yeah, Other any? I think we're good in the room. If there's other folks who have joined virtually, maybe last call for them. Yeah, any last calls with questions in the chat? I don't think I've missed any. Nope, so pretty good, pretty good. While you're looking, you want us to fill out the survey that you've given the link for. And then the other link is, if I'm understanding this correctly, students can sign up, they fill out, um, they get information based on what department they're interested in applying to. Amazing. Correct. Okay, very cool. Yeah, each individual department will send you a series of emails about their programs, research, um, admissions requirements. So all very useful information at this stage that you're exploring programs. Awesome. Thank you. That's really cool.
And I would say for all of us, uh, okay, Dion, real quick, uh, requiring page for geoscience, tier review. Tier review will not be viewed until it will be. Okay. So, Amir, can you see that in the comments? Sure. Yes. Yeah. I can, I can answer that for Dion. Dion, I. That's a challenging one. I would definitely take stock of all of the programs that you're looking to apply to because uh, you wouldn't want to not take the GRE just for Boulder if you also are looking, you because you don't want to close the door or window of opportunity to apply to other programs that may require the GRE. But if you find in your research that all of the programs that you're looking to apply for have a similar view of the GRE where they're not even going to consider it, then yeah, I wouldn't take it. Awesome. Parting thoughts, going once, going twice. This does not have to be the last conversation you have with any of these people you met on Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely email us. And, you know, I'm realizing that as we start to normalize and come out of the pandemic, um, for those of you who are online with us, Again, click on that Qualtrics link in the chat to fill out that survey. And for those of you in IRL, that real life thing, I'm going to make sure I remember for our next presentation to do an easier like bitly link versus like trying to a, type out like a, a whole. Like a QR code maybe on the flyer. Yeah. 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 We'll work on that part. <laughs> but yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody who was here to present, everybody who was here to learn and participate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, take care of Durango for me. I miss it uh, immensely, but I am excited for you all to join us up in Boulder if that's where your path leads us. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.